Good afternoon, everybody. At least good afternoon in Europe. Um, I know that there are participants from elsewhere, so I probably should say good day, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth wider webinar on COVID-19 and development. The webinar series features an, a lineup of eminent researchers and development specialists presenting new research on the implications they foresee of COVID-19 for global development efforts and economic and social impacts for the global south. The idea of the webinar series is that by presenting the research findings on these urgent matters and by discussing them together, we're able to not only make the issues visible, but also to contribute to finding solutions to them. My name is Finn Tapp and I'll be chairing uh, today. And today we will uh, discuss Africa's lockdown dilemma. And let me now uh, briefly give you a short introduction uh, to the speakers. Uh, first, uh, there's Eva Maria Ecker, uh, who is an applied economist holding a PhD from the University of Sussex. Uh, she's a wider research fellow based in Mozambique, uh, where she works as a technical advisor for poverty assessment to the Ministry of Economy and Finance. Her research focuses on rural development, migration, climate change, and labor markets. And she has uh, research and field world experience in Brazil, Ghana, Peru, South Africa, and now uh, Mozambique. Um, her colleague, uh, Ricardo Santos, is a UNU wider research fellow stationed in Maputo uh, in Mozambique as technical advisor to the Center of Economics and Management Studies at the Faculty of Economics at Edward Mondlane University. Ricardo holds a PhD in economics from the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex, a master's degree in economics from the Nova University in Lisbon, and an MA in Development Studies from the IDS. His doctoral research examined the post-conflict labor market and education in Timor-Leste. Um, Eva and Ricardo uh, will be the ones presenting uh, uh, their research today. Um, and then we have Tillman Brook, uh, who is the founder and director of International Security and Development Center, ISDC. Um, and Tillman is also professor at the Natural Resources Institute, NRI, of the University of Greenwich. He's visiting professor um, at the London School of Economics uh, and Political Science. Um, and team leader, developing economics and food security at the IDZ uh, near Berlin. Uh, Tillman is also the co-founder and co-director of the Households in Conflict Network and the principal investigator of the Life in Kyrgyzstan study. Uh, Tillman's research interests focus on the economics of household behavior and well-being in areas affected by violent conflict, fragility, and humanitarian emergencies, including the measurement of violence and conflict in household surveys and the impact evaluation of programs in conflict uh, affected areas. So with this um, very uh, good uh, lineup of uh, three experienced speakers, um, I'm very much looking forward to what they have to say. Now, uh, before handing over to the speakers, let me stress uh, that during the session, please do use the Q&A tab so this is down in the row at the bottom. You can see a Q&A tab. And there, please write your questions there. Uh, and we will then, uh, or rather, I will then ask the presenters and the discussion, a discussion uh, to address them uh, after the presentations. Uh, please do put clearly uh, uh, your name uh, so that I can see um, who has asked the question. And then I will read the question to the uh, presenters and to the discussion, uh, asking for their uh, reactions and comments. And I'm very much looking forward to this because uh, the topic of today uh, is a very hot one. It's a very difficult one. And it's an uh, intellectually stimulating one also. So uh, with these words of introduction, uh, welcome all of you. And uh, now over to the uh, speakers. Hi everyone, and thank you so much for your interest in our presentation. Um, I'm Eva Maria Egger, as uh, Finn already uh, introduced me. And I'm going to start with the presentation before Ricardo takes over. And we are presenting today 
a study that we have recently published as a wider working paper called Africa's Lockdown Dilemma, High Poverty and Low Trust. And this is a study we conducted jointly with our wider colleagues, uh, Patricia uh, Justino, Sam Jones, and Ivan Manik, um, and who are all part of the Mozambique uh, team of UniWider. But before we dive into the presentation, uh, let us first get an idea of uh, what uh, you, the participants of the seminar, think uh, of this topic. So we prepared a small opinion poll for you to um, respond to. We have two questions that you will now have time to answer. The first one being, do you think that strict lockdowns are the appropriate response to COVID-19 in Sub-Saharan Africa? Yes, no, or localized yes. And the second question is, how high is the risk for social unrest in Sub-Saharan Africa if strict lockdown was introduced? Do you think it's high, medium, low, or there's no such risk? Please uh, respond now, we leave you some time for this. So I hope you all cast your vote um, we will look at the results a bit later in the presentation. Um, and now let's dive into the topic. So as was mentioned earlier, we are, um, um, we are looking at the question around lockdown in lower uh, income countries. Because as we know, there is quite a gloomy outlook of the economic impacts of uh, the pandemic. Um, and so we know that poor countries actually face a huge challenge by trying to minimize these economic impacts and at the same time trying to contain the virus and to reduce the burden of the pandemic in their countries. And as Mozambique country team, we were sitting earlier this year, uh, still most of us in uh, Maputo, and we saw how the pandemic was unfolding in uh, European countries and North America and uh, lockdowns being introduced and first cases arrived in the African continent and we started wondering what advice can we give to policymakers? Is a strict lockdown the right response for a country like Mozambique or comparable countries? Um, so obviously there's a huge challenge that these uh, lower income countries face. On the one hand, um, living conditions are relatively poorer, um, so maybe living conditions don't allow people to actually stay at home for a certain amount of time and, uh, um, and practice social distancing. Also another huge challenge is posed by high economic informality and lack of social protection or uh, things such as unemployment insurance or uh, the state, uh, the fiscal capacity of the state to support those who are unemployed and do not have a regular income. At the same time, going beyond that, we thought about the fact that actually containing a virus and imposing a lockdown and stay-at-home measures poses a collective action problem. You can only contain the virus if everyone um, abides by the rules of distancing and staying at home. And this has been shown in the literature that it, this type of collective action problem can actually be addressed if there is a certain amount of trust in the government's um, effectiveness in addressing these issues, but also in um, of trust in others. If you trust that your neighbor will also stay at home and keep distance, then this give, incentivizes people to also abide to these type of measures. So we were wondering if a full lockdown is not feasible because of these uh, rather poor living conditions as well as um, economic constraints to lockdown, can higher trust maybe help to offset this um, 
um, this lower level of preparedness? And if this is not the case, is there a risk of social unrest? And we focus um, in this study on the Sub-Saharan African continent um, by um, assessing a level of lockdown readiness for the countries and also looking at how this relates to trust and the risk of social unrest. And we use Afrobarometer data from 2019 for 30 countries, which I will quickly describe to you here. So the Afrobarometer is an initiative that conducts public attitudes and opinion surveys on topics like democracy, governance, and also economic and social um, factors. There are several waves already, and the most recent data set available is actually from just last year. So we have a sample of uh, almost 38,000 individuals in 30 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. We eliminated uh, North African countries to focus on uh, common characteristics. And a huge advantage of this data set is that it includes um, information about both the living conditions of individuals, but also about their opinions and their level and uh, indicators that will help us to uh, measure trust as well as risk of social unrest. And we complement this data with some information also from the world development indicators. So what do we mean when we talk about preparedness for lockdown or as we call it so-called lockdown readiness? Um, so we have, we post the definition that lockdown readiness is the ability of a household or family to stay at home and avoid public spaces without irreversible damage to the health and welfare. As you can imagine, um, in many contexts, or staying at home means that you need, um, for example, safe drinking water or sanitation system at home because otherwise you will need to leave your home several times per day and per week to actually, for example, go to a communal tap. At the same time, however, we also consider the fact that in low-income country context, um, people require um, a regular, either a regular income, and if they cannot work from home, which the majority of people in, this, uh, in these contexts cannot, uh, they would rely on savings. And so we try to find variables that capture this type of economic security um, to some degree. So we construct a very simple measure composed of five um, variables um, that are actually easily available in most uh, common household surveys or also in census data, um, as we did, for example, for Mozambique already. And uh, these components specifically are safe drinking water access in the home, basic sanitation and source of reliable energy in the home. And this is complemented by a measure of uh, whether the household has access to information or communication via a mobile phone or fixed telephone, as well as a measure to capture whether the individual has an employment that provides a regular frequent cash income. Or to say it differently, the individual does not frequently go without cash, implying that they have a lack of savings or don't have regular incomes which would force them to leave the house to buy the food that their family needs. And so we also differentiate here between partially ready households and fully ready households. Partially ready are those who actually have access to basic services in their home. So with additional for support in form, for example, of cash transfers or food transfers, these families could probably stay at home for a certain amount of time uh, because they have access to safe drinking water, sanitation in their homes. And then the full readiness would be if they also are prepared in economic terms and access to information terms. So let's, uh, let us look at the results. Uh, what we find in the data is unfortunately, but maybe not unexpectedly, a relatively gloomy picture only 6.8% of all the households can be considered fully ready. And however, if you consider urban and rural areas um, separately, around 12% are ready in urban areas, whereas only 2.5% uh, in rural areas can be considered ready. And this uh, 
on the one hand, of course, this means that we uh, that in rural areas you find um, very uh, poor access to basic services or um, stable employment. At the same time, rural areas do not face such a high risk to the virus uh, spreading because of much lower population density. So we will now focus a bit more on urban area results um, because of this context. Also maybe what uh, is not shown here, but interesting to mention is that actually um, access to information, for example, through phones is relatively high, but the really low and the big indicator, the indicator really driving this uh, readiness down is access to a stable source of income. Only on average around only 14% report to have this stable source of income. If we only consider those partially ready, we see that relatively more households have access to basic services, however, with a huge variation again across countries. So in Liberia, only around 13% of families can be considered partially ready, whereas in Eswatini or Senegal, this goes up above 80%. And then, of course, you might think that our readiness measure is maybe just capturing what also income levels are capturing. And to some degree, this is of course true that these are closely related. So here, what we do is we plot um, real income per capita against uh, the level of readiness at the country level. And what we find is a log linear relationship. And what does this mean is that if you would approximately, if you would double real incomes, this would be associated with an increase in just five percentage points in the share of red, uh, ready population. So actually income levels alone do not determine how ready uh, a country is. And now I will hand over to my colleague Ricardo um, on the second part of the presentation. So, Thank you, Eva. Uh, and so, as we, as Eva said, if we if we looked into into readiness and and the picture isn't uh, necessarily very positive, we would try we try to look into to trust and see at what level and if it would be possible for trust to be an offset of of this lower readiness. And to do that, uh, we looked into two dimensions of trust. And one dimension that looked into the capacity of uh, collective action within the communities. So when we look into dimensions of trust, we, we looked into what is trust towards institutions, trust towards state and its representatives. And it's basically, we did it by constructing a, a variable, a latent con continuous variable uh, that is uh, standardized and basically is constructed with if, uh, answers to the, to the questions on trust uh, the people have on the president, the parliament, the police force and traditional leaders. Then we also looked into the horizontal uh, trust, so trust amongst peers or within the community. And to pick that up, uh, there's no direct uh, question that picks that uh, per se, but uh, a very good uh, way to pick it up is how much do you trust the person like close to you, the vendor close to you where you buy your groceries. So on, on Afrobarometer, there's a question that asks basically when a vendor sells you grains, how sure are you that you get the correct amount of change? And if, if uh, the, the answer is positive, if the person is sure, then it, it shows that there is a level of trust at the community level. Then uh, a third dimension that isn't necessarily a dimension of trust, but it does tell something about how able is the community, are people to organize themselves uh, for community, for collective action, including possibly protest. Uh, we do see, we do basically construct a variable that is again a uh, latent continuous variable and based on answers to, to, to whether the person, the people are members of groups or participate in meetings. 
So what we do with these variables, with these uh, uh, indicators of trust and capacity of collective action is that we, we relate them now. We're going to look how do they relate with uh, lockdown readiness and then uh, how together lockdown readiness and trust uh, co um, may uh, relate with, with some activities that are related with protest. So the first exercise we did was we, we constructed a log linear model and basically what we did is it, this is um, not very common uh, necessarily in economics, more common in other social sciences. Uh, we run a regression on basically it would be a multi-way contingency table. And what we try to do and we, we try to pick up is how likely is someone within the, the sample that we have to have a particular characteristic that can be picked up and that, uh, that we want to pick up. And this is given by odds ratios. So to read the table, we have to do something which is sometimes not uh, very usual, which is, uh, so it's not whether the signal is positive or negative, it's if the, if the coefficient that we have there, the value that we have there is above one or one, the, actually it's above one, that means that there is a higher probability in this case of finding someone with that particular characteristic. If it's below one, it's a lower characteristic. So let me illustrate, for instance. So if we look into fully ready in the first column where we have a, ba the, a baseline, in this, in, this particular, in this particular regression that we did, we basically established a baseline and we assumed what if there's no a relationship between someone being fully ready and uh, have, uh, uh, have showing inter institutional trust or having uh, showing capacity to associativism. What if there is all of these are independent? So there are no interrelationships between these characteristics. So if you look into the first one and we see that there's a very low probability of finding someone that is fully ready. And we already had seen that uh, before, but this basically confirms so 0 0.002 is significant and very, very low. And we also also see that basically all of them are below one. So basically it's more likely to, found, to find someone that's not fully ready, someone that actually doesn't show institutional trust, that actually doesn't, isn't very prone to associativism uh, and looking only to those uh, characteristics that show to be significant. Now, more interesting is actually to look into the, the next column. So column two, three, and four. And uh, what we see actually, it, there is a higher probability of finding someone that is both fully ready and trusts the state. And also significantly higher probability of finding someone that is fully ready and trusts their peers. And when we look, to, when we look into column three, what we see is that uh, institutional trust and the relationship with readiness mitigates a bit. Uh, it becomes non-significant, uh, but the readiness, the community trust uh, actually keeps being significantly correlated with being fully ready. Uh, and amongst the higher income group, there's no, no such, such signal. So what is important to what we can see and, and find here is uh, as an important the reference point is that if anything, there is a positive relationship between readiness and trust. And so the offset effect isn't there. And actually, then it's actually more felt amongst the poorest in, in the population, this, this uh, eventual positive relationship. So next slide, man. Thank you, Eva. Uh, and here, what we look then is what's the likelihood of social unrest given levels of trust and lockdown readiness. And again, I think the first signals, if we look, uh, first of all, these are also odds ratios, so they should be interpreted as, as before. And, and again, the signal might not be uh, the one that we, we would hope for, uh, but so it's more of a high opener. First of all, I, looking into the urban areas, to, it's important to notice that people in urban areas are more likely to participate in protest uh, than people in rural areas and also are less likely to like or to accept curfew. Uh, 
then what we also see is that uh, institutional trust and community trust uh, correlate negatively with participation in protests. So the more people trust the state, the more people trust themselves. When it's significant, it shows that they would be less likely to protest. The capacity to mobilize, uh, I think it would be expected, actually indicates a more like a higher likelihood of protesting. But if we look into readiness, particularly in urban areas, we see the, the more the more uh, positive the situation is for families, so the higher the number of ready dimensions, so of dimensions in which a household is ready, the less likely it is that people participate in protest. So again, readiness and trust go together towards more a peaceful setting, and lack of readiness and lack of trust uh, will point out to a worse, uh, more higher likelihood of protest. And if we see to how people would, would agree with, uh, with the government and perceive the government as working towards reducing uh, inequalities, what we see again is higher trust and higher readiness uh, would, are significantly correlated with more trust that the government is actually pushing for lower inequality. And finally, the point that I made before, higher institutional trust and, and more more and being more uh, ready for lockdown actually increases the acceptance of a curfew by, by the population. So all in all, what this actually tells us is that it's in, with high probability, we, wouldn't, we shouldn't expect trust to be offsetting, at least in this context of, of uh, sub, sub-Saharan African countries, trust to be offsetting lack of readiness. And as we, as Eva mentioned before, we were not seeing a very, uh, a very positive uh, picture in terms of, of readiness. So what, what should we conclude? Is lockdown an option then for countries in Sub-Saharan Africa? And what does trust play? What role does trust play in this fight against COVID-19? What are the risks of social unrest? So before trying to look into this, let's see what you thought of, what you answered. Uh, so these are the, the results that you, you have. And so I, in general, I think uh, the majority of you were already uh, a little bit septic, skeptical about um, uh, the effectiveness of strict lockdowns, but still, the major, a majority would expect would uh, propose that localized lockdowns uh, would be appropriate. So uh, I'm not going to try to delve into what each one of us thought what localized meant, but uh, there was an expectation that it would, in certain situations, work. But I think even more and more significant is that 91% of those that responded think that there is a relevant risk of uh, social unrest. And uh, the majority actually thinks there's a high risk of, of social unrest. I think, if anything, uh, our results are confirming your expectations. So what can we conclude then? So the findings do suggest that, especially in poor countries, people are not only least prepared for lockdown, Actually, their trust in government and also in the, at the community level is lower and uh, the risk, so therefore the risk for social unrest is higher. And that is also particularly noticeable in urban areas. So what can be done about it? Uh, so lockdown is one, one measure to, to push for uh, social distancing. Of course, there are certain measures, uh, policy that have been put in place and we don't we are not testing, we didn't test any, any policy measures, so we will not be advocating for one over the other. Uh, we're just trying to figure out whether there are uh, possible measures that one would, would consider. And of course, we have the use of masks and community masks is now being general, generally used uh, throughout. And also, we don't need to necessarily lock down people into their houses, uh, but some measures can be made of, of not of not having open certain places or not organizing events where, where concentration of people is more likely. 
but what we could do, we could look into is the role of social protection policies. And this could be important into uh, creating conditions for families not to suffer so much uh, with, with, um, with the lockdown and being able to actually endure it a little bit more and reduce it. And that could be uh, basically via cash or food transfers. And uh, in other situations, this has been explored by by and sh and showed to be effective by Titus and Pexon, the Juan and Bank and Justino and Martorano. If anything, it's it's clear that this is a huge challenge and uh, one where where governance will be tested. Uh, if any silver lining uh, can be found is that if governments actually find and prove themselves hand, uh, effective in handling this crisis, public trust in them would actually can actually increase. So hopefully that challenge can be met. And with this knowledge that lower readiness and lower trust is present, we can find a way. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Eva and uh, Ricardo. Uh, and we will now turn over to the uh, discussant, uh, Tillman Brook. Tillman, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Finn and uh, Eva and Ricardo, um, for both organizing this interesting seminar and for your very interesting work. Uh, before I start with my task as a discussant in earnest, um, I would like to um, have a brief advertisement um, because um, with Patricia Justino, who is one of the co-authors of this paper, and Anke Höffler at the University of Konstanz, um, I have started in March um, a survey project called Life with Corona, which addresses very similar topics to the ones that we're discussing here in this seminar today. And if you would like to fill in the survey, which is a global survey in 25 languages, please feel free to go to lifewithcorona.org and take the survey there. And uh, we have one wider working paper out already where we look at trust and I will cite some data from our paper um, and from our survey. Um, as I discussed your paper, it's very closely related. It's like a twin project, you could say, I think. So that's the end of the advertisement. Um, now coming to your uh, very interesting paper. I think it's really uh, thought provoking and it's really interesting and I'm um, glad uh, you made it um, because I think we need a better understanding of how not just the pandemic is impacting all of us in terms of the health impact, but also how the fight against the pandemic um, is impacting us. And the first measure of choice until we get good drugs and good immunization in the fight against um, coronavirus and COVID-19 are behavioral strategies. So the governments are trying to encourage us to do, you know, sort of less of this and um, face scratching and more of that, you know, safe coughing and then more of this sort of social distancing. And of course, in the extreme, not at the individual level, but at the collective level, lockdown. Although I'll challenge in a moment the idea that this is an extreme measure, um, at least everywhere at all times. So we have these new social phenomena or policies or measures or strategies, and we need to understand them, how they work, but also um, what impact they have in turn, because maybe for some people, the impact of the fight against um, COVID-19 is bigger than COVID-19 itself, um, especially if you're not um, affected with the virus itself. So it's asking very important conceptual questions and it's asking important empirical questions and it's using, which is also to be commended, existing data with all the limitations that the audience has already noticed in the very interesting Q&A. So a couple of things that you are effectively doing, although these are my words and not yours, you know, how can we deconstruct lockdown? What does lockdown mean? Is there any ways of measuring it or approximating it? And I think it's great that you have this sort of um, readiness indicator or index. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great concept. And, very useful and very practical. Um, so when does it work and for whom? And uh, what are the implications of this? Yeah, all the way to social unrest, which sounds very scary at first sight. Yeah, and you're using it a bit as a sort of like, that's something you want to avoid, yeah? Which in times of not having a pandemic, you know, if they're not violent, I mean, protests are healthy, right? So they tell the government what people think. So you might want to step back a little bit from just looking at it as a negative thing. Although of course, you know, protesting safely in times of corona is a tricky organizational challenge. So let me just comment briefly on a couple of concepts and a couple of empirical things. And I'll try to race through as, I think it's only 20 slides or so, it's not very much, but I'll try to be quick so that I don't take more than my 10 minutes. Um, first, the, the concept of the lockdown. The, the purpose is, in my view, 
not to stop the pandemic. And I think you have to maybe spend a little more time on you know, why people do or why governments impose lockdowns. Yeah? I think all it can do is to buy time. And the countries that were first hit by the pandemic needed to lock down first. Some did it, some didn't, you know, differential impacts there. But um, the ones who did it early, um, they benefited most um, and they bought time to come up with other strategies, social distancing, not touching your face, coughing and all that, yeah? So what this means is that lockdown is only part of a portfolio of measures. It's not the, you know, the silver bullet that we would like it to be because when the lockdown finishes, and it logically has to finish at some point, the virus is still there. Nobody can lock down for 18 months until some scientist comes up with a, with a vaccine, right? So, so naturally, it has to have a, a, an end data, sort of a half time, yeah, where you, where you have to stop um, relying on it, okay? So I think that's, a, that's an important thing to bear in mind. Now, what are the characteristics of a lockdown? Lockdown is not total, unlike the name may suggest, because if you really lock down, I mean, you couldn't do anything anymore, yeah? You know, unless you have three months worth of food in your basement or in your house or in your hut or in your tent or wherever you live, um, you know, it's not going to work. And you're not going to have any nurses in hospitals or doctors. You're not going to have any train drivers. You're not going to have any, you know, somebody has to bring the nurse to the hospital or the doctor. And so, yeah, chances are you have some people who work, yeah? And, and so the, it's, it's a it's a thing of degree, right? It must necessarily be a thing of degree unless we're like a nuclear war and everybody dies who leaves their bunker, yeah? So, so that's one thing. The other thing is geographically, it could be a national thing, but it could also be a regional thing. It could be a local thing. In fact, an individual lockdown, I think is usually called a quarantine. So, you know, it, it's sort of the spatial thing. And as we process or progress, I don't know if that's the right word, if we proceed maybe rather with the pandemic, we will find, uh, We've bought the time at the beginning in some countries. We know what else can be done. People got at the point, basically. So we can use more, you know, disinfecting and all the other measures and maybe use less lockdowns. But we will need them if they are outburst locally yeah, in order to stop them from becoming national outburst again. So I think that's something else maybe that's important. Um, now, the third thing I noticed is that your lockdown index is quite sticky because the type of variables you choose don't change quickly, right? I mean, you know, these are big topics, employment, wash, electricity. These are like decades long development agendas. Yeah. And, and so basically the, the policy implication cannot be to try to improve preparedness because these lockdowns have to be imposed at short notice. We can't prepare for them really. I mean, at least now it's too late. If you haven't stockpiled on the food, you know, it's too late by the time uh, lockdown starts. And so um, I think it's more about helping to understand coping, which is of course part of what you look at, but I just want to sort of contextualize it a bit, okay? So, um, yeah, and then some people ask already in the discussion, you know, GDP might be one thing. I think if you looked at other concepts like poverty or inequality, um, I'll come back to this comment later. If you look at the deviations from your fitted line in the cross-country regressions, yeah, maybe it's be interesting to see, you know, what explains that deviation? You know, there's some outliers, yes? some countries who do really well for low GDP, they're actually very well prepared and others are badly prepared. And maybe it's like population density, maybe it's, poverty rates for a given level of GDP, et cetera. So, you know, it'd be interesting to, to play more with that, yeah? Okay, um, I already s said that um, lockdown is a sticky concept. Trust, on the other hand, um, is not very sticky. And it may be very asymmetric. It's, it's, it's very hard to win somebody's trust and very easily lost, yeah? And I think that's something that we're seeing now. There are some countries where the governments will be trusted in principle, but trust is slipping. Yeah? Gov trust in the government, vertical trust, yeah, is a vertical relationships are, are tripping. So it's much more volatile than your lockdown preparedness. And so you're having a sticky concept and a volatile concept, and you need to think maybe a little bit about what that means for empirical analysis. I think the other thing is the polarization. Again, as we move out of um, lockdown, and somebody commented on that, that that's an important uh, topic. I agree with that comment. And, you know, it seems to be polarization. Some people true believers in lockdown, and other people, um, you know, don't really care, and they go out partying and, and, and so on. Yeah. And so, so there seems to be um, something happening, you know, something pulling us apart, yeah? Um, and it's not so much the average level of trust that's of interest, but it's the um, polarization into trusting people and non-trusting people, if you like, yeah? So I think that's interesting. Um, okay, I've said this thing about the going in versus coming out, yeah? And um, very briefly, two pieces of data from our survey. And um, here, this plots for three countries where early on in the survey, we had a lot of responses. I'm sorry, these are not developing countries, but I think in principle, these are universal issues that we're looking at and the share of respondents who support um, measures by the government. And that is dropping in several countries that we plot here over time. Um, these are different time 
periods. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. It says there. So this is like early April and late April and early May. So you know, blue and uh, orange. And these are quite significant changes. Yeah, in in the response. Uh, sorry, in the support for government measures. Yeah. So I hopefully. You know, that shows how dynamic this situation can be, yeah? Nobody's gonna get an extra toilet or more drinking water or mobile phone contract during that period, yeah? Uh, support and trust. So if you show very low trust or low trust, um, then you have very little, relatively little support in the government measure, still actually more than 60%, but still, you know, relatively low. If, you've, if you show very high trust, um, then you um, uh, are much more supportive of government measures, yeah? So trust, support for policies, policies, et cetera, you know, they really um, um, are, are highly different, yeah? So these are like clusters of, of data. Okay, a couple of quick measurement issues. Um, and the density of the living space, I think must also be surely very important. And I wondered if something should be in the surveys there. So if you have large families, you know, you, um, you can easily reinfect within the family, even if you're all in lockdown, you know, one bad sheep, one, one sort of person, you know, who, who gets infected, maybe the person who has to go to work, yeah, can then infect the rest of the household. Um, and also just simply the sanity of it, yeah, if you have den low, no, sorry, high density, number, many people per living space, it's how much harder to cope with lockdown than if you have a large space in which a few people can, can sort of um, disappear into, yeah. Um, childcare, homeschooling, parental work, I think those are all also important variables for making, you know, it seems that a lot of families, people of middle age, you know, with, you know parents basically, uh, find it much harder to cope, especially if the kids can't go to school, yeah, so homeschooling and all that. Um, and so I think those are also other variables. I think I'm a bit worried that if the index is too narrow, I realize you have to do what you can get, but these are other issues. We have to make sure that we're not omitting them. Um, then you, about measurement, you group that into, you know, um, few factors fulfilled and many factors fulfilled. And I wondered if you wanted to use the continuous because you're otherwise just measuring the difference between people who fulfill three or less versus four or more. And I think that, you know, you're losing some data basically. So I thought that was a pity. And um, I realize Afrobarometer won't be able to answer that for you, but the lockdown readiness over time, again, going in and out, we have already discussed that. I think the dynamics matter. Maybe there's other ways of how you can exploit uh, dynamics. Briefly on the interpretation, as somebody also said in the comments, we know that in urban areas protests are more likely um, and that aligns um, with your findings, which is good in principle. Um, I've said earlier, the, the, you know, maybe you can explore the outliers a bit more and you know, maybe you can tell a story even with country, like with individual data from certain countries, you know, study what happens there. Why are some countries better prepared than others and what impact does that have? Maybe group by that, yeah. Um, and then again, somebody in the comments said that, so my job has been half done. If you read the Q&A, what do trust variables really mean? They are very specific representations or proxies of trust. They're not really trust, they're sort of you know, proxies. And so you have to be a little careful. If you, if you think the trader is a cheater, then that's not the same as not trusting anybody. Yeah. Um, and I'm a little worried about omitted determinants of unrest. Maybe there's something missing, like the glue holding society together. And very briefly, this is basically your theory of change from lockdown readiness to trust to unrest. Yeah, and that's plausible, I think, and it's good, and I'm glad you're doing it. But, you know, we have to question a little bit the connections, yeah, the question marks. Like, it, you know, could it go the other way around? So let's break this down a little bit. We have from lockdown readiness to trust, okay? That makes sense, yeah? If I'm really difficult and the government imposes something, then maybe oh, I don't like the government because they're disregarding my difficult work, uh, my difficult living conditions. But you could also have from not being ready for lockdown because I have no job directly to unrest. There's a huge literature on that, yeah? So you don't need to go through trust. So at least you have a sort of direct connection from lockdown readiness, for example, unemployment, to unrest, yeah? And I think that's something you may want to account for in your modeling. Um, but maybe more importantly, you know, you could even have it the other way around. Maybe an area where the population is very like this, you know, um, is going to have less investment and therefore less jobs and, and poorer living conditions. I'm not going to, as an NGO, go into an area where people constantly throw stones, yeah? So I'm not going to work there, yeah? So, so you know, maybe there's even a reverse causality, yeah? You're not going to be able to resolve this easily, I think, with the cross-sectional, but it's just something maybe that um, needs to be accounted for. Very briefly, last slide, I think, is lockdown an option? Um, does medicine taste bitter? Um, yes, I think it does, actually. Um, so the, the, what I think on the one hand, if you knew the benefits of lockdown, you could really you know, discuss the options in a sort of cost benefit analysis more. Or if you said, what's the combination of measures that is feasible? Yeah, maybe there are other measures that are more feasible if lockdown is less feasible. Yeah, and so like if you looked at sort of what do you need for information campaigns? Well, you also need the communication, for example. So the communication is key because if people don't have phones or radio, you can't do communication campaigns or at least it's more costly. Yeah, um, okay, I've basically said that.
And final point, I agree that cash transfers can help poor people in the pandemic. Um, I'm not sure your paper causally proves that, but I think what I'd be beware is that I'm not sure you should sort of sell your paper with this sort of, you know, let's reduce the chance of unrest because I think the production function of unrest is very complex. And as I said, right at the beginning, you know, a little bit of unrest, if it's not too violent, it's actually not too bad. Yeah, at least sort of protesting, you know, can be quite healthy. So um, to sort of use that as a, you know, um, do what we say or else you get unrest in your country, you know, I think it's a very strong and maybe overly sold uh, policy prescription or motivation, yeah? So thank you for your attention um, and look forward to the debate with the lively audience and our great presenters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, gentlemen, um, for this um, very succinct uh, discussion, uh, comments. Um, I, I think I, I want to uh, turn to uh, Eva and Mar uh, Ricardo just uh, to begin with, just uh, whether they have some uh, immediate uh, reactions uh, and comments, uh, responses to your uh, to your uh, observations. Uh, meanwhile, I will be uh, looking at the questions um, uh, that have come in uh, and start preparing uh, for those. But uh, Eva, uh, Ricardo, you have any uh, reactions to Tillman? Yeah, maybe I quickly start. I mean, first of all, thank you very much, Tim. And I think all of your comments are very, very thoughtful and uh, really useful insights. And I think um, I, I probably will also answer indirectly to some of the comments that I saw in the Q&A that actually um, you're absolutely right that our kind of chain of the argument um, is based a lot on the fact that what we measure um, the way we measure it is assuming a certain um, initial condition situation, right? To say, okay, let's say before the pandemic arrives, what are the conditions under which people are living? And can we from these conditions then uh, expect the population to be able to deal with a strict lockdown? So I think it's very right to, to, to mention that we, we have to be very explicit about the assumption that we are making here and that we are not, uh, that indeed our uh, measure of lockdown readiness is not at all claiming to capture everything that could be important and is important for living through a lockdown. And it's also not um, able to actually, or it's not, we are not intending to capture the dynamics over time with this uh, type of lockdown readiness. Uh, because I think that exactly would then um, require a much more refined approach to be able to really look at all the different aspects that uh, we now observe uh, this life under different scenarios and uh, measures um, uh, is requiring. And maybe another thing to mention that also would, might respond to some of the questions is that we are um, explicitly not looking at the health sector as such, right? So we are not including in the preparedness the, con the, the idea of um, is the health sector of a country actually able to uh, do contact tracing, do testing adequately, to identify whether there are suspicious cases and so on and so forth and to deal with the pandemic. So that's a, a research that we really trust the um, health economists and health experts to, to do. So we are really approaching it more from the socioeconomic side and um, yeah, that would be my response. Thank you. Okay, Ricardo. Yes, thank you. Uh, let me just echo first uh, the thanks that uh, from that Eva said to, to Tillman about the, the questions. They are really good and really uh, help us think and to, to structure what, what are our, our ideas. Um, I think I was going to take, I'm going to take one, some points and one that I find very interesting to, to, to mention and I, we actually value very much what, we, what you said and agree that it, this is not about GDP per se and GDP actually doesn't show up as one of the variables necessarily that look into, they don't, it doesn't, it doesn't come into readiness per se. We basically, what we found is that there is a relation between being more ready, rest ready uh, and uh, the indicator of, of GDP per capita and, and finding that first of all is log, log linear, which means that basically increases in, in GDP become less and less effective. That's what characteristic of, of the logarithm. 
And second, uh, that when you mentioned that it actually related with, with a lot with poverty, yes, very much so. It actually relates a lot with multidimensional poverty. Uh, and we would be able to find those indicators of, of uh, lockdown readiness to, to be akin to indicators that are used when, when looking into multidimensional poverty. So what, what I think a, a very important point that, that I think we, we brought, but maybe not very explicitly, is that the, of the initial conditions that Eva was, was mentioning. And, and this is true on both, on both the indicators of, of lockdown readiness that we, that we looked at and were possible to, to look into uh, with, um, with the data we have, but also on, this, on, the, on kind of like the baseline of trust we could find uh, at this moment when, when we look into the information and making use of the fact that the Afrobarometer um, surveys that we, we used are very are contemporaneous, are almost contemporaneous to, to what we're finding, what we're looking at right now. So they kind of give us a baseline of what, how would, be, how would it be possible and how, how, what would, could we eventually expect to be happening in these countries? Um, if a strict lockdown was to be put in place. Uh, one of the things that I think might have motivated us to go this into a, a, an, a, an underlying idea that we were looking into a strict like lockdown is that what we found in countries like Mozambique where we work and in other countries is that they moved to a much stricter form of lockdown uh, when, uh, from the get-go. In, in very low cases, a very good, a low baseline of, of, of cases, and they already moved, and they immediately moved to a, to a higher level of lockdown than we found in countries like in, uh, in Europe or, or uh, in other uh, high-income countries. So, which would make us kind of a higher risk of moving into an even more extreme form of, of lockdown if, if uh, numbers increase. So, it would be, so we found that important to, to try to measure the, ba the baseline on whether the families, whether the, the, the households would be ready to endure uh, if they were asked to be in a, in a stricter lockdown and, and whether they would trust their, their governments in, the, in those policies and eventually react against. Um, I think one of the points that maybe on the theory of change we could look into, but basically uh, we don't, exp maybe we should try to be more explicit, but it's not necessarily the case that lockdown readiness cause, there's, that there is a causal linkage between lockdown readiness and trust. They actually, it's the explicit correlation that we look there. We don't, uh, those, um, what, we, what we look into is whether there's a likelihood of finding both households that both have uh, higher lockdown readiness or higher capacity to endure uh, the lockdown and higher levels of trust towards, towards the community and towards the, the government, bearing in mind the notes, the points that you raised about how, how strong are the, how the proxies in actually picking up and, and, and saying this is trust in the community or this is trust in vertical trust. Uh, finally, the point on social protection, very good point that not to sell it as a, an arrest mitigator. We actually look into more as a mitigator of the consequences of lack of lockdown readiness. So it's more about trying to mitigate the, the, effort, the, the stress over families and given that they might not be, uh, they might suffer from a lack of capacities on those characteristics. I'm going to shut down and give space for other questions. Okay, thank you very much, Ricardo. Uh, so we will now turn to um, the questions that have um, uh, come in. Um, and um, basically, um, I will have to be quite choosy. Um, and then uh, some of the others, uh, you would have to uh, get responses to uh, in writing. But I mean, there is a, I think, personal question from Simone who's asking, uh, is employment the most reliable source of income in times of COVID-19? Are sources, e.g. pensions, government transfers, necessarily uh, less stable? Um, so, so, so that sort of relates to the, um, uh, to the index. And I mean, uh, th th there is a, um, uh, 
related question, not to specifically to uh, what Simone is asking, but also to the index. Uh, and that is Kabuga who's asking, please comment on the impact of food supply chains on lockdown readiness, noting that in countries of high urbanization, curfews have immediate negative effect on households and may result in unrest. So, I mean, um, could, could you maybe kind of elaborate a bit on, on, on what do you see as, as sort of missing um, and uh, are your assumptions necessarily right? I mean, uh, the readiness index, is, as I saw, it doesn't have a food availability in there. Um, so, I mean, you, you might want to uh, just comment on, on, on these two first questions. So I quickly start and, and this is, uh, of course, uh, are all very good points and we have looked, um, I would want to blame the data, right, as usual, it's like it's all about data availability, but um, it's not uh, full, the only reason, right? So we, of we also looked at a question that was asking, have you gone without food? That is, I think there's some uh, related questions in the Afrobarometer. Um, and the results are not that different. So the, the overall picture remains very similar. And one idea why we kept it fairly simple was that actually this way we can also look at, okay, this differentiation between, okay, basic services for staying at home and then the other dimension of readiness and uh, not become too complicated and then having the challenge of how to actually aggregate it. And um, maybe regarding the, the same is also true for, for whether there's, um, yeah, whether employment is the only relevant source of income, um, which uh, we weren't able to look at whether the individuals receive other um, sources of income such as government benefits, but also, for example, remittances is a big topic in these times, right, that now are expected to dry out. Um, so I think that it has a lot to do with, uh, on the one hand, data availability and at the same time trying to keep things relatively simple to convey an idea instead of uh, trying to find the perfect exact measure. Okay, uh, Ricardo, do you have anything to add? Nothing to add. Okay, um, then um, there are a couple of questions on sort of um, relating uh, lockdown readiness to GDP. Uh, uh, one uh, person asks or states relating lockdown readiness to GDP is very misleading. Trust and capacity to do mass testing is even lower in countries like Nigeria than in countries with a lower GDP. Um, but then um, on the other hand, um, there is uh, Sinyan Nyamo who says, I am also concerned about lumping all these developing countries together. The results are likely to differ significantly if the countries are grouped by income levels. Um, I've noted the weighting by country population. So we have here sort of two quite uh, different perspectives on, uh, on, on relating to um, uh, the, the red and the intake and GDP. I don't know, do you have any um, reactions to that? Well, I can, I think I've tried to stress that. So the relation with GDP is one that became apparent, but it's really not one that we, that we have on the, on ingrained in the readiness. Uh, so basically the readiness, the lockdown readiness index that we produce, it's generated from answers on, on characteristics on the household and personal characteristics. It turns out that they, there is, uh, and, and, and I think it should be very important to stress the point that Tillman made, there is a relationship with outliers and the outliers might tell very interesting stories that we should look at. But I think I wouldn't make much of a, a conversation about, about the GDP there other than uh, there is an, an apparent relation and that there is is not a, a direct relation, it actually mitigates with, with, uh, with higher levels of, of GDP. I also would like to note the point that, as Eva said, it's not about the readiness of the health system. So it's not about the readiness of doing contact tracing, to do contact tracing, which is the, the readiness capacity of the health system uh, that we looked at. So that, that would be something that would be very interesting to look at, from, but would be a, a, 
in a way, a complementary research question to our, the one we found. What we looked at would, was at the household level. Uh, so readiness, how were people ready to endure lockdown? And even not how, uh, whether other measures would be more or less effective or are being put in place more effectively or not, depending on GDP. That's not what we looked at necessarily. Uh, I don't know, Eva, maybe you pick up the second, complete what I said and pick up the second point. Yeah, I don't know whether we have time. It's uh... Uh, please repeat, Eva. Do we still have time for other questions or not? Well, there will be one more question coming for sure. Um, but I mean, I think uh, Ricardo has uh, addressed, so we might want to move on. Um, so let me move on to the uh, next question that is there, which I find uh, interesting. Uh, which is a question from uh, Nina uh, Tenio. Um, and and what, what, is, what is asked is, did you look at government systems or the level of democracy in, in Sub-Saharan Africa as part of your research? Authoritarian or military regimes versus more democratic governance models and correlation with readiness for lockdown? Um, so uh, th this is a question that I think you should uh, be able to address. Yeah, I think this is a very good question. And admittedly, we haven't yet looked at this in detail. Um, but I think it relates a lot also to Tillman's comments about the whole how, what is exactly our uh, chain of uh, reasoning from the lockdown readiness and trust to the social unrest risk, right? So um, participation in protests is not in every context a bad thing. Um, and that also relates to the type of regime, as well as the, the question around inequalities and the perception of inequality that people might have. And they, related to this, the levels of trust in the government and how the government copes uh, might actually differ by the political system. And there, have, there has been this, uh, the wider seminar on uh, exactly posing that question whether autocracies might be better than democracies in handling uh, the pandemic uh, because of certain you know power in imposing strict measures but um, this is something we can definitely explore more with our data set and in this context okay thank you very much um, now um, there is a, a question uh, from uh, Shores, um, which I think all three of you, um, Tillman, uh, Eva, Ricardo, might want to uh, chip in on uh, here at the end. Um, I mean, Shores starts by saying, first, grateful for the good presentation. And uh, then he says, Africa and Mozambique in particular are moving towards the most critical phase of the pandemic. Uh, now knowing about their unpreparedness for severe measures to combat the pandemic, what are the possible ways out? Um, in other words, uh, what to do? Um, and I was wondering whether uh, the three of you could uh, briefly um, uh, reflect on that. Um, it does uh, relate um, to also, for example, a question from Buranga Das, who says, uh, whether government preparedness and management influences readiness, question mark. Public health and institutions are important for readiness. What is the role of public policy? So I was wondering whether this was a way to um, uh, come with your uh, final remarks and uh, observations. Um, and le let me begin here now with Tillman. Thank you. So on the one hand, none of us are doctors, I think, yeah, at least not medical doctors. On the other hand, I think we exactly need to overcome that sort of silo thinking. So we, not, you know, as a result of this study, we, and you probably had an intuition it was true before anyway you know we know that a strong wide-reaching lockdown is practically not feasible yeah and will lead to either people breaking the rules and therefore creating other secondary problems as a result of rule breaking you know or just people getting ill anyway and it might even increase then the inequality you know um, based on some desperate people have to break the rules and the better off can stick to them so I think we need both more, you know, if we need lockdowns more localized, more intelligent to account for the circumstances of the locality, 
um, I mean, in a way, Af many African countries are still quite lucky for having relatively low infection rates compared to some other countries. So maybe a more localized approach is possible. Again, we need to buy time and we need to combine elements of a strategy, I think, and in including a lot of public awareness and behavioral change strategies. Yeah, and so I think there's a, a lot of effort has to be put into that um, because every bit we can do to reduce the, the spread is, is worthwhile. Yeah, so this R, this famous R number. Yeah, so we can bring that from three to two to one, you know, we'll save lives. And so, so I think that should probably be the starting point from my perspective as a humble economist. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. And there are a couple of specific uh, questions to you also, uh, which I'm sure you'll be able to address. Uh, one is asking um, whether uh, they can answer your questionnaire twice, for example. Um, so uh, you will be able to see these questions afterwards. Um, Eva? Yeah, I, I would totally agree with Tim. And maybe to add is also that um, for the global community that this uh, really is asking for support because there is, uh, we all know that there is, uh, for poorer countries, there is a fiscal constraint in spending money. You can't just go and now support everyone uh, in order to have them stay at home. So that's not as easily done um, as uh, said. And one thing I came across uh, a lot reading about uh, the COVID challenge in um, poorer country context is that we cannot forget that there are many other challenges at the same time. So it cannot be that now we focus everything on COVID and forget address about addressing other challenges uh, that still persist, but actually maybe to be more comprehensive in the approach we take that then will improve um, the, the COVID situation, but at the same time still pursue the agenda of improving overall living standards. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Ricardo, succinctly. And not, not adding much more to what was already said in which, which I agree. I think what we find here is that it's very clear that the, the quick reactions that we had in Northern, in the global North don't necessarily work in the global South. And I think that's a, that's a very important warning that we need to, need to, to think about, which means the lessons, the, the solutions that we were ready to put in place and probably were put in place more quickly in, in the global south and more stringently in being more, more stringent in the lockdown measures in the global south than, than when we started in the global north, they don't seem to be sufficient. They don't seem to be uh, able to to give the answer that we need so we need to think about what are the answers and and as as Finn as um, Tillman said I think uh, and I agree completely it's something that needs to be done together with uh, with the public health experts economic economists and what we can give into this uh, to, to the solutions and uh, try to figure out what what we can do but uh, we're still trying to grasp what what we can do Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, to our discussion, Tillman Brook. Thank you very much uh, to the uh, presenters, Eva and Ricardo. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the organizers. And I mean, um, th there's one sort of uh, question uh, which was also put up, which, uh, which I'd like to sort of address in, in, in concluding. Uh, um, this is Nato from uh, Kenya who asked, finally, what can think tanks do so that their voice is heard by world leaders uh, compared to leaders listening to rumors. Um, I, I think one thing that uh, think tanks can do is exactly what we have been doing this afternoon. So I encourage all of you to look out uh, for the uh, webinar series. I encourage every one of you to engage uh, with the material available on the uh, UNU wider website, as well as other websites. Uh, Tillman also listed his. Uh, go there, uh, get informed, uh, contribute, uh, engage, and we have seen this afternoon uh, that it is, it is possible uh, in spite of challenging circumstances. I'd like to say thank you very much uh, to the uh, more than uh, 100 participants uh, who have been uh, in, in at least part of uh, the seminar, and thank you to the 77 uh, who are still with us. May you all have a very good rest of the day and uh, see you uh, in the next uh, webinar. Um, and um, 
for some reason, um, I cannot open. Oh, here, the chat opened. Um, gentleman is saying thank you to all for a great seminar and visit us at um, the website he has given there. So uh, that's another added response uh, to the question uh, that came up. I apologize for um, those where I could not um, uh, include the question. I had to make quick assessments, either that they were already uh, wholly or in part responded to, uh, but the uh, presenters will go through uh, the questions and will then address those um, that they can um, after the webinar. So with this, thank you very much to everybody and uh, have a good day.